Genesis chapter 22. We're in Bible reading number 107, I believe. And we're in one of the most, one of my favorite chapters of the Old Testament in the book of Genesis. One of my favorite chapters in Genesis. Abraham uh, has sent away his son Ishmael. Ishmael and Hagar in God's hands, in God's protection. Now in Genesis the 22nd chapter and verse number 1, we see so much in this chapter of the Bible. In uh, the 21st chapter, in verse 33 and 34, it says that Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba, and there he called on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham's a pilgrim in the land of the Philistines for many days. And now something completely changes in Abraham's life. And I want to ask you a question. Has God tested and proved you? Because that's exactly what he's going to do here. He's going to prove Abraham. And I think he proved Abraham not so much that he knew what Abraham would do, but for those around Abraham. Because Abraham had been an ungodly buzzard, hadn't he? Hadn't he? In all reality? Sold his wife two times, one to Pharaoh and one to Bimelech. Now it came about after these sayings that God proved Abraham, proved him. Now, when you go to a metallurgist, if you have a, a ring or something, you don't know what, whether it is uh, gold or, or, or what grade of gold it is, whether it's 18 carat, 12 carat, 10 carat, a 24 karat pure gold or whatever, they test it. They assay it. So that's the word right here. And God is going to assay Abraham. Now God calls him Abraham now also. Not Abram, but Abraham. Abram meant exalted father. Now, now we have exalted father of a multitude. Now, you have to go back to the time that Abraham lived in, which is, you know, thousands of years ago. Now, in the pagan societies, God had asked their gods, that is, uh, by demons, uh, had asked them or demanded them to sacrifice their children in death to gods. Moloch, different ones throughout that period of time. And God detested human sacrifice. He detested it. Now it came about after these things that God proved, assayed Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And he said, take now your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, Yishik, pleasure, laughter, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him up there as a burnt offering on the top of a mountain, which I will tell you. Now this totally blows Abraham's mind away. Can you imagine? Now here God is talking to him. He's talked to him before. And he's talking to him now and he's asking him to do something that is totally against who God is. And what God is. So Abraham rose early in the morning. He didn't get there, didn't take off at night time. I'm always late for everything, as you guys, girls and guys know. Abraham rose up early in the morning, early. And he saddled his donkey. And he took two of his young guide men with him. And Isaac, his son, and he split wood for the burnt offering. And he rose and he went to the place which God had told him to go. Now, on the third day, three days, 
The Bible three it means a lot in the Bible. The word three. Three is the, tr tr the number of God. The number of the triune God. And on the third day Abraham raised up his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Now this place is still in Jerusalem today. I have been there. It's Mount Moriah. On the third day he lifted up his eyes and he saw it from a distance. And Abraham said to the young men, Stay here with the donkey. And I and the lad will go yonder. Now, he said something here in faith. And we will worship and we will return to you. We will worship and we will return. That's first person plural. Now, Abraham was singular. Abraham and Isaac are plural. There are two of them. And he says here, we will worship and we will return. Now, when you go to the New Testament, you find out that Abraham believed God, and he believed God in such a manner and such a force that he believed that if he offered that son and killed him, right there, because God said that that son to him would be all nations be blessed. And he believed that God was going to raise him from the dead. And Abraham took the wood, of the burnt offering, and he laid it upon Isaac his son, upon his back. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. Now back then, you know, they didn't have matches. So they had to take embers. So they took embers. He took embers with him. Now he had split the wood and, and probably he had split some, split some of it very, very fine so that he could uh, get the fire blazing in a hurry. And he took his hand, the fire, and the knife. Usually the fire, the embers, they carried in a clay, clay pot. In a clay pot. Oh. And so the two of them walked on together. And Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire. You got the... You've got the embers in the fire jar. And you've got the wood. Now where is the lamb up for the burnt offering? In the bush. The lamb up for the burnt offering. And Abraham said, God will provide for himself. God will see to it, is what he actually said. God will see to it. God will see to it for himself, the lamb, for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac is probably unsettled at this time. He's going to be a whole lot more unsettled pretty soon. Then he came to the place in which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there. And he arranged the wood, and then he bound his son Isaac, and he laid him on the altar on top of the wood. By the way, that's not a real comfortable bed. And Abraham stretched out his hand, and he took a knife to slay his son. Are you picturing this with me? He goes up on Mount Moriah. Isaac is worried because he sees no lamb. And now Isaac is bound. Can you see the terror in that boy's eyes? He sees the fire. He sees the wood. He, see burnt, he has seen burnt offerings before. He saw how the animals were killed and slaughtered and then how that they were put upon a wood pile and set on fire. And he thinks of himself as such. Was he willing? 
Was he screeching, crying, clawing, and, and, and all the time this was going on? Or was he submitting? Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And then, but the angel of the Lord, the Malach, Jehovah, Jehovah himself appears to Abraham. Now, Jehovah is there. Abraham sees Jehovah, Isaac sees Jehovah. Here in this place what we call Jehovah Jireh later on, but what it means, Jehovah Jireh, it says the Lord shall provide or shall see to it, but here also the Lord was seen. He appeared there. That the angel of the Lord called him from heaven. Abram, Abram. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not stretch out your hand against the lad. And do nothing to him, for I know that you fear God, that you, you fear God, that you believe that I'm going to do what I say, and that you fear me enough to follow my instructions. You have been tested, and you have proved yourself. You have been proved. You have been assayed. You have been assayed. Now, I know that you fear God. Since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Abraham is a type of God the Father. That allowed his son to go to the cross of Calvary. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son to whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, that, but through him they might be justified, they might be sanctified, they might be saved. Through so our substitutionary Savior, 1 John 2 and 2, he was our substitution. He was our substitute. We all should die on the flames of hell. The flames of that sacrifice typify the flames of hell. Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross of Calvary. He was crucified. He did die. God proved his love to us. He assayed his love to us that he gave his only begotten son. Do not stretch your hand out against your son, for I know that you fear God, and you have not withheld. For three days, in the mind of Abraham, Isaac was a dead man. For three days, Isaac, in the eyes of Abraham, was a dead man. Three days to get there. How long was Jesus Christ in the, in, the, in the tomb? Three days. Jesus Christ was a dead man for three days. Isaac in the mind of his father was a dead man for three days before he got there. Since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. God tests us in so many ways in life, doesn't he? Have you ever loved someone so much and that they betrayed you, that they just hated you? The, the more you loved them, the more they hated you. Mm -hmm. The more you loved and the more you tried and the more you sacrificed, they hated you. This happens with parents, it happens with husbands and wives. It is a assaying your character is what it is. A person is the sum total of everything that's happened to you, all your experiences, and how that you have reacted to them. That's what you are, that's how you're assayed. 
God allows many things to happen to us. Have you ever raised a child? You out there, have you ever raised a child that you love so much, you sacrificed so much, you stood in the gap, and then when they grow up, they don't like you at all? And you sacrificed so much for them. That's a test. It's a test. Old children look at their parents, want their parents to love them, and there's no hope. Parents look at their children and want them to love them, and there's no hope. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was ram caught in the thicket by his horns. Now the strong... <clears throat> The strongest part of a ram are his horns. Isn't that right, Marilyn? What? The strongest part of a ram is his horns. Oh, yeah. You see these rams up here? They're just 10 miles east of us. The strongest part of that animal is horns. And his head is like a, a shield, his skull. Uh, Marilyn and I went up yesterday for a little while up in the mountains and we run upon a herd of three antelope. And they had horns so tall, very tall horns, very tall horns. That's the strongest part of that animal. That's how he protects himself. Now this, this ram here is caught in thicket by his horns. By the strength of Jesus Christ, he was stood on the cross of Calvary and he expired up there by his mental, physical strength. He released his spirit from his body that was suffering. Abraham went and he took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. God has offered his son as a burnt offering in the place of us. And Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord was seen, or the Lord shall see to it, or the Lord shall provide, Jehovah Jireh. And it is as this day in the mount of the Lord, it will be provided, or God shall see to it. Abraham saw Jehovah, and Abraham was told not to sacrifice his son that God had provided to sacrifice. Abraham was willing to offer his son. God was willing to offer his son from eternity past until time today. Then the angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time from heaven. And he said, I by myself, I have sworn declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your, your seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. Your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. One of these days, in the millennial reign, Israel shall be the guiding light and the administrator of God's kingdom again. And they will possess the gate which all nations come to to worship God. Now, and if that's, that's in a physical way, isn't it? But now today, to this very day, the descendants of Abraham through the church of the Lord Jesus, the churches of the Lord Jesus Christ possess the keys of the kingdom, the gate to the kingdom, the keys of the kingdom of God. The keys of the kingdom were not given to Peter. They were given to the church. The church today preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament and in the New Testament, there is only one gospel, and that gospel is by the grace of God. 
It's only one gospel. It's by the grace of God. And in you, or in your seed, shall all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Galatians 3 and 8. Galatians. Galatians, the third chapter. Let's go there for a moment. See what Paul said about this very thing. Even, in verse number 6, Even so Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him for righteousness. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of the faith that are sons of Abraham. This is the fulfillment of possessing the gate of your enemies. The Lord Jesus Christ churches preach the gospel, and people come to God through that gospel. There's only one gospel in the whole Bible. In the Old and New Testament, there's only one gospel. Be sure that it is those who are of the faith are our sons of Abraham. Now he's contrasting those that believe in God and the very physical seas of the sand shore, Israel, here. He said it's not Israel that is, are the sons of God, but those that believe. Be sure that those who are of the faith are the sons of Abraham, with the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. And that goes back to Genesis 9 and verse 24, as we looked at before. Preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, that all the nations shall be blessed in you. So th those are, who are in faith are blessed with Abraham the believer. For as many a uh, as are the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, the righteous man shall live by faith. And he's quoting the book of Habakkuk here, The just shall live by faith. However, the law is not a faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs upon a tree. In order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentile, so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak to you in terms of human relations. Even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds to uh, conditions to it. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say as to seeds, as referring to many, but to one. And to your seed, that is Christ. For I am saying this, the law which came 430 years later does not invalidate the covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance is based upon the law, it is no longer based upon promise. But God has granted it to Abraham by means of promise. Why the law then? It was added because transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator, until the seed should come to whom the promise had been made. The seed is Jesus Christ. Now, a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if a law had been given which was able to impart life to save you, then righteousness would indeed have been based on the law. But the scripture has shut up all men under sin, 
that the promise by faith in Christ Jesus might be given to those who believe. But faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to faith, which was later to be revealed. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized because of Christ have been clothed yourselves in Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, made of a woman, made under the law, that he might redeem those that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Jesus Christ gave his son that we might have life. Abraham gave his son in obedience to that covenant and promise. It says in verse 17 and 22nd chapter, Indeed, I will greatly bless you, and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of heaven and the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of the enemies. And in you and in your seed all nations, singular, of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham lived at Beersheba. Now it came about after these sayings that it was told Abraham, Behold, Milcah also has borne children to your brother Naor. Uz the firstborn, and Buzz his brother, and Kamel the father of Aram, and Chesez, and Hazel, and, and Pildash, and, and Jidloth, and Bethuel. Bethuel came the father of Rebekah. And these eight, Melchah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother, and his concubine, whose name was Reumah, also bore Teba and Gam and Tahash and Micah. Now that was just the way, at the end of that, to say, well, the rest of us, Abraham's life, family are all... Uh, being blessed by God also. But not one of them, not one of them would be the seed of God through the woman of Genesis 3.15. Only through Abraham would this come about. Has God tested you? Has God tried you? Has he assayed you? His son was assayed out there in the wilderness when the devil tempted him. And we are assayed every day of our lives as we walk through this world. God assays us. And we are His. Our Father, we send this message out that it might glorify and honor you and you only. All the things that we do in this world are nothing compared to what you've done through your Son. As we're born of our mothers and fathers, we're born unto death. When we're born unto you, we're born unto eternal life. Father, please forgive me where I fail you. Please use your message. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.